Hello everyone, I'm here with another video today. In this video, I'm going to discuss part one of The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison is an African-American writer. She is a Nobel laureate. Her writings depict the effects of slavery and colonization in America on black people. She discusses these effects, the systemic um, racism and institutionalized racism and the effects of these things on black people on various different levels, primarily the familial and the personal. In this novel, she discusses or she shows the effects of colonization on various different black families and how the individuals of those families, they cope with this systemic racism. Some of the individuals, they manage to cope with it. They manage to function in a society that is against them. And there are other individuals as well who give up and who uh, submit to the uh, you know, system instead of subverting it. Now, in this novel, there are two main families, two main black families. One of them is the Breedlove family and the other one is the McTeer family. The protagonist of the novel belongs to the Breedlove family. Now, the Breedlove family is shown to be absolutely dysfunctional on many different levels. There are different kinds of abuse that take place in this family. Some of the abuses, they are a result of the system itself and some of them come because of the personal inadequacies and lacks of these characters. Then there is another family, the McTeer family, and that family is shown as a foil so that we can compare and contrast the two families, the dysfunctional one and the one that seems to be a little bit functional despite all the economic and racial injustices. Breedlove family has four members, the father and the mother, and then Pecola and Sammy Breedlove, the son and the daughter. Pecola Breedlove is the protagonist of the novel and she is a subject of different kinds of injustices that we have been talking about previously. Tori Morrison makes her to be the primary a victim of all of these institutional racist tendencies of the society and she becomes an object of oppression as well as strange kinds of evil desires and her character is very complex and there's a lot to unpack when we look at this character. On the other hand, the McTeer family has also four members, the two daughters, um, Claudia and Frida and the mother and the father. Claudia and Frida McTeer are both friends with Pecola. The novel starts with the McTeer family and it zooms into Claudia McTeer. She is a young girl. She is younger than Pecola as well. And she, um, uh, she basically is shown to be coping up with the experiences of racism in the society. Now, the novel begins with the narration of Claudia McTeer, or you can say that it represents her point of view. Claudia is a very young girl, so her emotions are shown to be quite unfiltered and she thinks about the society around her in a very naive and innocent way. And I think Toni Morrison has used that lens in order to show the injustices of the society in a magnified manner because in this way she is able to portray what kinds of injustices take place there, what kind of brutalities, what kinds of discrimination takes place there. And in this way, she is able to portray the effects of, you know, uh, this kind of discrimination on children as well as on adults. In the beginning of part one, Claudia experiences a racist incident. She encounters a white girl who is the owner or who belongs to the owners of a, of a shop, of a pastry shop. And that girl, that white girl, mistreats Claudia and her sister Frida. This compels Claudia to harbor negative feelings towards this white girl, this little white girl, and also other white people as well. So, uh, Tori Morrison tries to show this kind of an, uh, you know, uh, this kind of an event as a microcosm for a larger society that is full of racism and that is full of these um, uh, mistreatments towards black people. I'm going to read a few lines from the first part, from the first chapter, um, <clears throat> and then we can talk about it a little bit further. She rolls down the window to tell my sister, Frida, and me that we can't come in. We stare at her, wanting her bread, but more than that, wanting to poke the arrogance out of her eyes and smash the pride of ownership that girls her chewing mouth. So this shows that this 
this basis for hatred that Claudia feels or resentment that Claudia feels in her heart towards this white girl, uh, the basis of it, the very foundation of it is first of all this racial uh, discrimination between the two and also the economic difference between the two uh, girls. The white girl, she owns the shop or her parents own the shop. This means that she belongs to the upper, you know, um, segment of society, the upper economic segment of society. So she has that economic superiority over Claudia. But more importantly, this girl also tries to insinuate that Claudia and her sister Frida, they can't come inside the, uh, the shop. Now, this shop can be taken as a metaphor for the society at large right or the society and in general and this exclusion of Frida and <clears throat> Claudia it actually shows how black people were marginalized or they were pushed towards the brim of you know uh, the society or towards the margins of the society and how they could not be or they were not really welcomed into the mainstream of society so Claudia's anger towards this girl is quite um, understandable. It is justified because this is not just one solitary event that Claudia has to go through or other, you know, black girls they have to go through. It is something that is repeated quite often. So Claudia, it becomes a part of her nature to become a little bit aggressive as a reaction towards this injustice this racial injustice. After this instance, we get to know about the general circumstances of the McTeer family. We get to know that Claudia is sick and she is treated as an extra, as somebody who's not important, as a worthless person by her own family. So the parents in the family, they try to focus on their own, you know, uh, work and everything while completely disregarding the individuality and the personality of their own little you know girls this actually shows uh, what kind of a house Claudia grows up in I like this part very very much because Tori Morrison has done something really really intelligent here what she has done is that although she has shown two families, one of them, like I said before, is completely dysfunctional. That is the Breedlove family because it has all kinds of, you know, sexual, economic, psychological and emotional abuses going on uh, in it. However, the other family that is being shown in parallel to Breedlove family is also not perfect. If it were a perfect family, then it would have seemed like a caricature of the black experience. So in order to render the black experience or the narration of the black experience very, very authentic, Toni Morrison keeps a very uh, holistic view of black people in mind. And therefore, the McTeer family, the depiction of McTeer family seems to be quite uh, close to reality. It seems to be quite um, reliable. I'm going to read a passage from this part as well, this, this particular section of... Uh, part one in order to let you know what Toni Morrison herself has written um, using Claudia as a mouthpiece. So this is Claudia basically thinking about her family and their you know general circumstances. Our house is old cold and green. At night a kerosene lamp lights one large room. The others are braced in darkness peopled by roaches and mice. Adults do not talk to us they give us directions. They issue orders without providing information. When we trip and fall down, they glance at us. If we cut or bruise ourselves, they ask us, are we crazy? When we catch colds, they shake their heads in disgust at our lack of consideration. How, they ask us, do you expect to get anything done if you all are sick? We cannot answer them. Our illness is treated with contempt, foul, black, draft and castor oil that blunts our minds. So when we read this depiction, this representation of uh, McTeer family, we are jolted awake from our reverie or our dream of the American house or the American family system that is shown to be or that is, you know, supposed to be ideal. This is a perfect deconstruction of that ideal American family system. This paragraph, this 
section from the novel it pro provides a stark juxtaposition or you can say contrast to what was there in the epitextual features of the novel in order to know what epitextual features are you need to watch my previous um, video in this uh, series another thing that you need to keep in mind is that claudia is shown to be a strong-headed child she seems to be someone who has an individuality despite the fact that she is not treated as a complete individual by her parents this also shows that although the parents are neglectful and they are sometimes abusive as well at some levels but they are still not bad parents or you can say entirely or absolutely evil people they are people they are shown to be people who are neglectful of their responsibilities because of the circumstances the economic circumstances and the political circumstances in which they are situated so Toni Morrison, instead of, you know, showing these people to be evil, you know, uh, evil parents who are tormenting their kids, she shows them to be people who are just human beings, you know, human beings are very much capable of doing bad things, even towards those they, you know, are supposed to take care of. But here we see that Claudia, she does not take this uh, behavior uh, or this neglectful treatment um, of her illness by her mother to be very, you know, to, to be to, to very casually, right? She takes it to be, um, with, she basically takes it with a pinch of salt and she is critical of it. Again, this this shows us that she has a developed ego. She has a she has a consciousness, and she realizes that she is worthy of love, and the and the treatment that she is being shown um, is not justified. So I like Claudia's character very very much. I'm going to read a line from uh, from the text itself, and in this line we can see that she has a developed ego. She has a sense of self. She has an agency, and uh, this character is strong and um she is the voice of deconstruction or you can say the voice of uh, you know subversion in this um, novel so the line says my mother's anger humiliates me and this basically shows that she finds this treatment unjustified and she does not like it and she can actually realize that something wrong is being done to her. Now, as we move on into the first part, uh, there is uh, an addition of other characters as well. Uh, there are various different characters who are introduced. Now, one of them is Mr. Henry. I'm not going to focus on this character too much because Mr. Henry is a side character, a minor character, but he is important because he later on proves to be a vile person who is a pedophile actually. As for now, we should just remember that he is a tenant at, um, you know, the McTeer house. Mr. Henry is a character with um, loose morals, right? Because he is shown to be associated with different prostitutes and like i said before he later turns out to be a pedophile at this point we just need to remember that he is a tenant at the mcteer house this fact that mr henry washington is a tenant at mcteer's house this shows that the mcteer family although it belonged to the lower class but it was not completely bankrupt on the other hand when we go to the breedlove family the breedloves are absolutely bankrupt they do not have a house they do not have anywhere to live that basically intensifies their struggles against uh, you know socio-economic uh, injustices even more so the mcteer family although it is deprived in some uh, areas in some aspects of life it is not completely like you know um you can say um uh, deprived you know deprived in all respects now the novel moves towards Pecola's character and this is very interesting because Pecola is the protagonist of the novel, right? So she is very very um, interesting to look at and she is very interesting to read about as well and we are going to analyze her character now. Pecola is first introduced as a foster child uh, at Tears house. So we get to know, we, you know, when we read about Pecola, the first impression that we have of her is that she is obviously some kind of an orphan girl maybe, or she is completely like homeless. She doesn't have anywhere else to go. Maybe her parents are dead or maybe they are criminals or whatever. So that is why she is abandoned by her family and she has to live with the McTeers. So this clarifies her socioeconomic circumstances to us uh, in a very clear, uh, you know, uh, way. Uh, in the novel, she is described as a girl who had no place to go. 
right so she she is shown as a homeless person after this um fact about her or this you know piece of information about her is revealed we also get to know that she is made homeless because of her father's actions now her father is shown to be a drunkard and a violent person who sets his own house at fire right so he's obviously mentally not very stable he's shown to be somebody who is um absolutely reckless and who is economically um and financially uh you know uh, bankrupt and because of the actions that he you know carries out his family is made homeless tony morrison uses a very interesting word a very strange word for the concept of homelessness she uses the word outdoors now and then she describes the word outdoors as well she defines it and the way she defines it is quite um heart touching it is quite um you can say beautiful but at the same time saddening so i'm going to read from the novel the text the exact lines that describe this concept and then you can you know see for yourself outdoors as we knew was real terror of life the threat of being outdoors surfaced frequently in those days Every possibility of excess was curtailed with it. If somebody ate too much, he could end up outdoors. If somebody used too much coal, he could end up outdoors. People could gamble themselves outdoor, drink themselves outdoor. Sometimes mother put their sons outdoors. And when that happened, regardless of what the son had done, all sympathy was with him. He was outdoors and his own flesh had done it. To be put outdoors by a landlord was one thing. unfortunate but an aspect of life over which you had no control since you could not control your income but to be slack enough to put one's own kin outdoors that was criminal so as you can imagine collie breed love was considered to be an absolute maniac and a person who had no conscience a person who had no sense of responsibility because of his actions because of his irresponsibility and because of his you know selfish nature his family had to suffer and they had to be homeless they had nowhere to go and this shows that this was a constant fear being homeless was a constant fear that was there when it comes to black people because they could be turned you know turned uh, homeless they could be converted into homeless people if they you know if they were a little bit reckless because they did not have that generational wealth accumulated by their you know ancestors like the white people did this also refers to the accumulated wealth that uh, you know white people had and the advantage they had the the systemic advantage they had over black people the novel then introduces us to another phenomenon and that is the shirley temple phenomenon <clears throat> now shirley temple was a very famous um hollywood movie star she was a child actress as well and she was quite popular and she is she was considered to be this ideal face of uh you know little white girls and she was so beautiful and her pictures could be found on crockery and um like plates and you know other things like that so shirley temple was considered to be the symbol of beauty and or rather white beauty and this symbol was something against which all the other kinds of beauty were calibrated right so in this novel we see that there are two attitudes that tony morrison has shown towards this um symbolification or symbolization of shirley temple and the and the and the standardization of white beauty on the one hand we have pecola and frida who both love shirley temple and they are fascinated by by her by her beauty by her curls and they want to be like her so there is this saucer uh, in which you know pecola tries to drink milk and she tries to drink it really really quickly so that she could look at the face of shirley temple on that saucer but on the other hand we have claudia who is a force of resistance in the novel from the very start she hates shirley temple because shirley temple reminds her of all the dolls that are there that are given to her on christmas or on other occasions and she basically hates those dolls as well because everybody expects her to love those dolls and coddle them when she first of all uh hates them because the dolls remind her of the white girls who are always nasty towards her and secondly she 
is a child so she doesn't really like to show any uh care and nurture nurturing behavior towards another you know baby doll she is not into all of that so um instead of accepting the doll uh, when you know that is given to her on christmas she actually dismembers it she she pulls it apart and she throws it away and the interesting thing here is that um claudia she doesn't only hate the dolls and tries to you know harm them or dismember them she also wants to do the same to little white girls however she when she understands that she has that emotion towards white girls she is sort of scared by her own you know violent reaction towards this this tradition of 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 putting and bestowing white dolls to every little kid around this is something that's very very interesting here because nowadays you must have seen that there is this notion of inclusivity that everybody keeps talking about and now we can find dolls that look like black girls or chinese or you know asian people in general or even you know brown people as well like us brown people like us so people think that's a very good uh, you know um, sort of a representation because black people do not want to play with something that reminds them of whiteness all the time they may not be able to relate with that kind of a toy and claudia she is doing the same thing here she hates the toy she hates the doll and she tries to break it apart she does break it apart and she wants to transfer that hater towards uh you know white girls as well or you can say that this uh this this outpour of you know violent emotion she, that she has towards uh, you know white dolls it is actually a transference uh, of violent emotions that she has towards white girls so uh, it is a projection as well as well as a uh, you know transference i'm going to read the lines that actually depict these um these emotions the dismembering of dolls was not the true horror the truly horrifying thing was the transference of the same impulses to the little white girls the interference with which i could have axed them was shaken only by my desire to do so to discover what eluded me the secret of the magic they weaved on others what made people look at them and say awe oh, but not me so she is clearly you know confused by all the love and sympathy and care that is sh showered on these white girls by black people as well by black ladies by black women and not towards black girls who are made to feel inferior and worthless all the time so she is unable to understand that and instead of being fascinated by shirley temple and the likes of her she is just you know disgusted by it she doesn't like it she doesn't feel as if she needs to be in the race to be loved and accepted by others and she doesn't have to show the same emotions towards these you know white dolls or white girls this again shows that she has that you know uh, capacity to subvert or to resist the traditional norms of the society and she she can she can have that agency uh, because she has an ego that is well developed right whereas on the other hand pecola um, and also frida to some extent they do not have this kind of resentment towards white dolls uh, they have accepted that you know bombardment of ideology uh, about white beauty uh, and they have internalized them and now they especially pecola she hates herself because of her blackness and she likes white uh, girls and white dolls and wants to be uh like them as well and uh this basically is one of the basic foundations of how she comes to crave or desire for blue eyes or rather the bluest eyes right another important episode that takes place in this um part is pegola's menstruation so she is shown to be having her period and this indicates her initiation into the womanhood if we look at it from a you know critical point of view when she has her periods she is made to realize that now she can have babies which is kind of like a foreshadowing of what she's forced to you know do later on um uh, she will be raped by her own father so this this event is sort of like a foreshadowing coming event another important thing here is that when pecola starts her period 
um, Claudia's mother or Mrs. McTeer, she shows this sympathy and love towards her and she hugs Pecola as well as Frida uh, when she finds out that Pecola is having her period. So this also shows a new side of, you know, uh, Mrs. McTeer and we realize that she's not all bad and she's not all nagging like I said before she's just human and she is capable of showing these emotions of sympathy and love towards another human being uh, or another little girl who is going through something really really hard in her life right so this also lets us know that why Claudia and Frida they are much better and much more independent than you know Pecola could ever be because Pecola is not shown that kind of a uh, you know that kind of love and that kind of companionship and compassion by her parents at all she is completely abandoned by both of her you know um, uh, parents and at the end of this episode um, we are also you know told that Pecola uh, shows this wild desire to be loved because she asks uh, you know Claudia how somebody can be made to love her which is very very sad because we get to know that she is completely um, devoid like her life is completely devoid of love and her innermost desire and her most desperate desire is to be loved by another human being um, which also indicates the dysfunctionality of her family so the line that shows us that is then Pegola asked a question that had never entered my mind how do you do that how do you get somebody to love you okay so this is a very sad um, sad sad reality